are both architects with a long history associated with this school. They currently um, are partners in a firm that operates in Brussels, Athens, and Dusseldorf, miraculously at the same time, uh, and have worked all over associated with those different locations. Um, uh, both have a long association and history with this school, and I think in, in the brief, very brief summary I'll give of, of their careers, um, one of its lessons, and it's an interesting one, is the way in which individual lives and careers intertwine with institutions. And, and this school is, is what it is today in part for those careers. Um, Eleni was here in 1978 to 1983 as a student. Graduated in 1983 and has since, uh, in addition to her work as an architect, taught at schools around the world, including East London, Canterbury, Dusseldorf, the Kunstakademie at Dusseldorf, uh, the Berlaga Institute uh, in Barcelona and currently in Uruguay. Uh, Elias is uh, maybe one of this school's most renowned teachers in the last 30 or actually more years now. Uh, Elias first came to the AA in 1963 and for a 20-year period um, teaching alongside unit masters that included Bernard Schumi, uh, young Moisan Mustafavi, uh, Peter Cook, David Green, and a number of others that really shaped the school alongside Alan Boyarsky at that time. Um, from his very earliest days, shaped careers in ways that are simply amazing as a teacher. Uh, his students include such people as Rem Koolhaas, Zaha Hadid, Piers Goff, Julia Bowles and Peter Wilson, uh, Lorinda Spear, Stephen Hall, and more recently in different locations, people like Greg Lynn. Um, and it's a remarkable career in shaping uh, not just a generation, but really successive generations of different architects who in turn have shaped the discourse that we take to be architecture. Uh, they currently operate an office primarily out of Athens and Brussels uh, and have projects in both of those locations. Uh, in addition to a number of recent competitions that have been premiated and prize winning, have built works in uh, Greece, in Osaka, Japan, and other locations. Um, their work has been exhibited and published worldwide, as most of you know. Um, they built the Greek pavilion in the 1991 uh, Venice Biennale. The work has been featured in the Milan Triennale and any number of other exhibitions. Um, and of course, published in almost every architectural journal imaginable. Please join me in welcoming Eleni and Elias. Well, thank, thanks very much, Brad. Um, do I speak into here? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, that's better. Huh? Yeah. So anyway, it's established that I'm ancient. Uh, um, uh, but uh, Eleni is young, so as a result, I'm young too. Um, but um, uh, I, I must say that it, I, haven't been, I haven't been around this place for some time. And for me, uh, it's a strange uh, sensation, you know. It's a, uh, I mean, being in this room, uh, it was when I was a student. It was a dining room. Then uh, we turned it into a lecture hall, but it was called the dining room for many years, even though it was a lecture hall. Then we got Mark Fisher to to design that uh, monster um, console where the slides uh, always were projected backwards. Uh, this has been taken off, uh, but uh, it's kind of coming back to this place in a way uh, for me is um, a kind of a strange sensation of like, like uh, coming back to one's own um, island, um, only finding it populated by Martians. <laughs> a kind of a, it's, um, but it's a kind of a compelling sense of disorientation, at least that I get, a kind of a challenging uh, challenging uh, awareness of being in the same room but with, uh, talking to what used to be very familiar faces into completely unfamiliar faces but and knowing that you know here you are you are the kind of uh, present future for the sake of it, which is what uh, we've always been trying to be in this place and which is what this place uh, it has to be, and uh, if it's not that anymore, then it might as well not be. Um, but, I mean, and I'm using this kind of uh, 
um, oxymoron uh, kind of uh, present uh, kind of future with all the ridiculousness that uh, also goes with it because um, uh, this, this, that's a ridiculous side which really uh, attracts me and I mean I'm sure it's kind of ridiculous that aspect that keeps it alive and that aspect with which par excellence uh, keeps it critical um, it's this lack of total seriousness that somehow only on these shores I felt one could one could harbor together with with seriousness, which kind of uh, enables you to keep you away and to kind of uh, escape from banality. Where I teach at the moment, uh, we are dead serious. Uh, we do research, and we believe that we do research. Even though we are in Holland uh, and we follow closely uh, Rem's uh, precedent, we, we seem to be unable to learn from, from this uh, precedent uh, and its insistence on being conjectural, the fact that what he calls research is a sequence of conjectures which he sets forth before the research is carried out and which the research is said to prove with what he always called fabricated evidence. Uh, we take ourselves uncritically uh, serious where uh, in Holland. Uh, the new economy, globalization, research and we are connected the kind of network which is interfaced with kind of a banality of neutral comfort. Eleni in Spain, teaches in Spain, in Barcelona, and I'm going to pass one word to her, uh, where she invited me recently and I visited their studio and I found that every student um, is, uh, uh, is uh, given a computer. Every student that enters the school is, is, is given a computer which you realize that they use it to hide behind, because when you enter the studio, you don't see them. Uh, and uh, th that was the impression that I got when I visited uh, her studio. And then when you try to talk, again, about conjectures, uh, you realize that uh, uh, they, 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 they produce automatically diagrams uh, from that come out of the computers, and then you try to say, but it would be nicer if you produced ideograms that came from your brain. So in, in a sense, um, I begin by, by, by kind of uh, admitting that not only I'm ancient, uh, but I'm also, I'm also conservative and, and, and reactionary. And by reactionary, I mean it in the <laughs> Marxist sense that I'm, I'm kind of against progress. And I'm really enjoying <laughs> this thing very much. So uh, we've, uh, we've been asked to... to um, to uh, show some of our recent work since we've been away. And um, most of the work, is, most of the projects uh, have been designed by Eleni uh, because I've been kind of away trying to make money to, to help the office going along, kind of teaching here and there. So Eleni will be the main speaker, because, but as I worked uh, on, uh, on many of these projects, I'll be kind of joining in, kind of an interrupting, and uh, so Eleni, I mean, I, Sorry okay. for my listening. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Can you? Okay. Um, well, he's been too modest, but let's, let's cut to the chase. So, can we, oh, the slides are here. Um, anyway, I'm starting off by talking about the bad city of Europe. And this is Athens. And um, Athens doesn't really have urban planning. They don't know what that means. And actually, sometimes that's quite nice. And, um, and also, as you know, Athens has the Olympics, and perhaps if, if Athens managed to complete all its preparations for the Olympics, it will only be because the army intervened, and I'm sorry to the Greeks in the room. So anyway, okay, so this is Athens, and basically it's, uh, it's a city surrounded by mountains, a rising plain like Barcelona, but, but much larger. And um, so it has the coast and the mountains. Uh, yes. Um, uh, on the left is a picture of um, 
of Athens, uh, well, it's ancient Athens, but also it includes the Roman bits. Um, so basically, the old city around the Acropolis was uh, set back um, from the sea, of course, against invasion. And the port was at some distance. Um, and uh, in late classical times, uh, after many wars, they decided to enclose the road to this port. And this, this plan, this uh, road is still visible in Athens. It's a four kilometer strip. And here we see a kind of American archeolog archeological school reimagining of that road. Uh, next. You do it. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> Okay, so, um, well, actually, maybe I should go back. Well, no. Um, so this is a, this is a view from uh, one of the mountains. Uh, am I allowed to reverse one? Yes, yes, you can. Yeah, okay. Feel free. Okay. Um, it, it, well. You're at home. Okay. <laughs> it's a mountain that doesn't appear here. The mountain on the other side is called Hymettus, and you might have heard of that because of honey. And um, we're concerned with this bay. Ilya, can you point out the bay? Yeah, but on this old plan. And, um, and you can see that there's a, a road going back to the center of the city, uh, the Roman road. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, you do it, you do it. Okay. Uh, no, he was pointing to that, the long walls, it's called. And this is a, a Roman road built by Hadrian. And, um, and so, anyway, what happened basically was that Athens grew um, in the modern times, because it's a modern city. It grew like this, it grew north, and it grew um, uh, eastward down the coast. And this is the separate city of Piraeus, which tended to grow that way. And in between is this kind of marshy lowland um, that uh, it's called the Bay of Phalero into which the two rivers of Athens come, these two, and is, is very low-lying and uh, very unhealthy. And so uh, in, the, in the early years of the century, when the cities started to grow together, this is where the factories went. Okay, forward. Okay. Well, actually, yeah. perhaps if it's worth pointing that uh, on the picture on the left, uh, you see what Eleni was describing, this kind of... Uh, sea of, uh, of uh, urbanization that has, uh, Athens has now become <coughs> viewed from uh, Hymettus, the mountain, from the top of the mountain that, uh, that is, uh, Eleni, if you can point it on where it, where it lies well, there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, basically what, what really characterizes Athens is and really what in fact makes it a very beautiful, turns it into a very beautiful city, uh, is its geography. And the, the geography, uh, the fact that Athens is contained by mountains and also uh, contains within it hills that are become reference points, of course the most important one of them being the Acropolis, uh, gives it a geography that no matter what happens to it uh, in terms of urbanization, it remains a very beautiful city. Anyway. I'm showing you briefly um, a project that I did uh, with my uh, graduating class, fifth year class from the University of East London in this area. And, um, <coughs> Some time ago. Yeah, 1990 actually. So this is really going back. And this was, um, this is the Bay of Phalero. And um, they took the uh, long walls and made it into literally a park with businesses in it. Um, they put a science strip here on one of the rivers. They've made a park out of this one. And this all became a kind of Olympic gate between the two cities. And, um, and over here was a kind of media thing. This is the existing Hippodrome. And this became a conference center. And then we did a whole program in the water on the other side with islands. So, uh, there we are. Um, <coughs> So what was um, quite interesting about that plan was that this was something that was done from London, um, just an area that we found quite interesting, and has since become uh, the main um, area of new planning, in a sense, um, in Athens. Uh, 
and the olympic strip will be a part of the olympic strip will be going along here so but until that time it had never been talked about and so now i'm looking at this site many years later we were asked to come and work on this site so actually i'm sure that you're always probably hearing from architects who get commissions and this and that and 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 you think that architecture is about sitting down and having this wonderful commission and taking your you know meeting deadlines blah 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 and so this is another aspect of architecture um the greek government had decided that uh it needed to raise money and it wanted it allowed uh, nine casinos to be built in the country in different places and this was the casino for athens and um the well the government is a little bit corrupt and um and so basically uh they uh they wanted their their friends to make bids for these casinos and um so what they did was that the whole of uh greece goes on holiday on the 1st of august and on the 7th of august they published in the kind of trade magazine um in in something that was 1 inch by 1 inch a little announcement about this uh, competition and um and that they they gave a window of 9 days to do this competition in and um and no 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 they they gave a month but of course during that month everybody was away oh yeah so there were 9 days left of september so actually um so their favorite ones were busy and um someone that they were a little bit scared of who's who's a, a very interesting uh, person he's a he's inherited um he's a developer and he's inherited a big um uh, anglo greek uh, developing company called jnp some of the older people in this room might remember that name and um and he's actually trained as an architect and took the company over from his father and doesn't practice as an architect but has a huge art collection and so he was one of those sort of second wave of people to come along and find out about this project and he called us up and by that time we had 9 days to deliver a project now we weren't the important people in this competition um the competition was nothing to do with urban planning it was nothing to do with architecture the government didn't give a shit um but our guy was quite smart and they realized that they had to also add some lipstick to their financial bids this project this thing was just about financial bids and putting together consortiums of casino people builders etc etc and um <coughs> and and actually where they propose uh, this part of athens where they're proposing to um build uh this casino is actually a very very rich part it's the richest coastal suburb and it's called paleo phalero so um our developer felt that actually um th this that the second step uh, of this casino would be that the people of Paleo Phalero who are government members and the rich people would actually rise up against this casino being there and he wanted to have something that was actually intelligent and and even beautiful in this uh intense urban situation so um anyway the one on the right is that does have our final design on it but i show this diagram just because that uh that that just shows the extra land that was being built out for the casino okay um now this picture is a coastal highway basically taken from here and looking across a, a pretty awful site actually um the the site is is uh, reclaimed land and um at at this end this part here it has a very pretty park of paleo phalero and um and the rest of it is kind of athletic centers this is owned by the navy and is a navy museum you can see that ship is a famous warship and yeah and um so these were these were all sort of uh, uh olympic training this kind of thing and this is a government built um uh yachting center for very big yachts and anything purple is owned by the greek orthodox church perhaps one thing to add is that uh, uh, what happens in addition is that where you see this kind of spaghetti here is at the end of uh, at the end of uh, of uh, a straight fast uh, the uh, roman road six lane avenue 
that leads uh, to the airport. It bifurcates at this point and goes to the airport, and, 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 and this direction goes to Pyrios, no. which you see <laughs> across the bay. In that direction. Sorry, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, and you see from, from the buildings there, uh, th this peninsula there is the, is, uh, is the peninsula uh, of, uh, on which the city of Piraeus is, is. And uh, therefore you see the bay here, and across uh, there you see a kind of a sports uh, palace there, uh, which uh, I, I pointed out because uh, across the bay is another site which we will be showing okay. you a uh, project on. Anyway, so um, <coughs> the deal with this competition or this uh, site was that uh, uh, there had to be a 25,000 square meter casino and it had to be all on one level. And, um, and in return for getting this, this casino bid, whoever won it would um, have uh, the use of this site for 20 years. And, um, and in return, because it makes so much money, casinos, they had to build a conference center for Athens. So Which was given over to them. Yeah, so basically it was 25,000 square meter casino, 18,000 square meter conference center, 7,000 square meter hotel um, for the casino, and um, 4,500 square meters of marina stuff. <coughs> and all of this had to be nine meters high maximum. And, uh, it, uh, and uh, following on from Eleni, what Eleni's analysis of the client, one of his wishes was to, to try to also overcome this barrier that the traffic creates from yeah, the I'll residential area. Sorry. I have slides. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, the number one problem of the site was just what Ilya was mentioning. There's only two access points, uh, this one, which is for the yachting, and of course you can always walk onto this park. And this one, which is just something five meters wide underneath the highway overpass. And um, so actually the first problem of the site uh, when we went there was somehow to look at the roads. Oh, another thing I forgot, we had to actually provide uh, parking for 7,000 cars on the surface. Um, so we had to sort of look at the roads and see what we could break open. So we broke open the delta. This, is, this D is called the, like in Greek, delta. The, the name. Um, we could get access there, so we could be coming from Piraeus, we could come from the city and enter here, we opened that, and that along this fast road you could just have fast entry. Okay, next. <coughs> and to do that with trees as well? Well, the trees were our wish. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Anyway, um, so, uh, so basically this design started to grow from the shapes of these roads and from the shape of the size of these buildings because if you can imagine 25,000 square meters in one story, um, it takes a lot of, you know, these are pancake buildings, <coughs> very, very flat. And the reason for this flatness was that just behind this suburb, the mountains rise very fast and very high and that's where the most expensive housing is and everyone is looking down on this thing. And, and we so had a, we had the restriction. The maximum height allowed was nine meters. I said that. <laughs> You're getting very old, Ilya. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, so anyway, fr from this this need to absorb um, a lot of fast entry traffic and uh, and and the kind of numbers of people represented by seven thousand cars, and opening the roads, we started to get the shaping of the site. And, um, and then actually the, our main uh, idea with this very fast design was simply to, uh, to treat um, the site and the roofs um, as, a, as a, a landscape that you could look down on. So they were expressed as kind of um, colored and garden parterres. So just quickly, um, that's the conference center, this was the hotel and the casino. Uh, okay, next, so speed this along. Um, here you can see how flat these buildings are. The hotel is like just managing to squeeze into a second story. And um, yeah. And this, this is the garden design in between. That's the quick plans. 
So as this build, as this kind of uh, whole territory is visible from these very high-rise apartments that exist and also are being built around it, the idea is to make it look like a kind of uh, like one large tropical plant or a parrot or a fish or something that was just there, a piece of nature. The roofs be were becoming very important. Um, actually, here, our second client was the London Clubs International. We were really lucky, um, as we found out later, to actually start doing casino work with this incredible client. And um, I don't know how many people gamble in this room. I don't. But um, the, the London uh, Clubs, they're the ones who own um, the Ritz Hotel and the, the famous one in Nice. Um, uh, uh, or is it Nice? Yeah. And um, the one on the QE2. And so the fact that they even had to have slot machines in this one was very shocking for them. They didn't like this at all. So actually, they were, they were looking for something very tasteful, very beautiful, that was somehow popular, and etc. cetera. Um, so uh, anyway, um, because also we couldn't have in this location flashy signs and so on, um, even, our, even the lighting is completely the opposite of Las Vegas. We just started using the undersides of things and, um, and also certain garden elements. This is, this is a big water jet. Where is that light? There. Like Geneva, but smaller. And this is a, a wall of water that actually provides a security for the casino garden there um, to create the uh, ambiance. So, and then here on the, on the left is just a curious thing that actually to somehow explain the size of these buildings, the distance between this canopy, these are canopies, that's for the hotel and that for the casino, the distance between them is one kilometer. Um, and, and actually the, you, the casino one is so big because in these kind of uh, large scale casinos, you actually have to have eight lanes of uh, traffic passing under the Port Crochet at one time. And of course, they were kind of really insisting that they had to have signs that were visible Wait. from the, from the road. I'm, not, I'm, not going to say oh. I'm leaving it for you. Okay, <laughs> you can say it. No, there it is. <laughs> anyway, so yes, the only sign that they allowed um, was this little volcano because it was all part of the, you know, can you see it? Yeah. And, um, we and actually, this that, we got permission because it was nature. <laughs> yeah. OK, sorry. Ilya, maybe you should do the next one because oh. it's not, OK. OK. <clears throat> now, the next one, uh, what's that? OK. The next one, uh, OK, well, anyway, the, what happened with that casino was it actually Argos won. And, um, but then they lost because um, I don't know if you remember um, Andreas Papandreou and his fantastic wife, Mimi. And um, anyway, she was a very interesting woman and um, she had a friend. And uh, so our guys won and then, then it lost. And um, She was interested on the side too. Yeah. So, their, so their bidder won afterwards. So I, I know these things also happen in Northern Europe, you know, but a little more decorously. But our client was okay. a very, very uh, persistent person, and he wouldn't give in, so he bought a site right across the bay, next, <laughs> do next door to where this, uh, uh, where this sports palace is, and this time he got Hilton casinos and Hilton hotels. Okay, so work. next. And so this, that, uh, that stadium that, you s that I just showed is here, and that's here. That's the uh, Peace and Friendship Stadium. And this is actually the, the uh, oldest modern stadium in Athens, uh, built by the army. <laughs> um, that's it, this here, and that's the home of Olympiakos. Maybe you've football, heard of yeah. Yeah, football. And, um, and so our site actually is this site here. And um, it's very hard to take a picture of this site. This, is, this was a big factory that made cotton and dyed it colors. And um, uh, again, we had a maximum building height, <coughs> which was 23 meters, about six stories, let's say, in a normal kind of evaluation, which would equal 64,000 square meters of building. Um, so 
the story of this one. Uh, yes, if you could focus, sorry. Um, Athens until recently only had one uh, uh, metro, and that was this that connected the main city to the center of Piraeus. And it, it went past our site. And in fact, it islands the site. I mean, there's, there's only a kind of high level bridge uh, taking people who live here to the football ground. And otherwise, all other um, access is under a highway or on a little kind of overpass. And, um, but this is the metro station. So um, uh, our client uh, bought the whole site, which was called Valka, and he was negotiating to buy this building. And he had this idea that he would like to look at uh, leisure and um, sort of superior kinds of, uh, oh, you know, um, entertainment. Um, he, he wanted to actually bring something to this site because I didn't tell you the whole history, but basically all these factories were shut down in 1990 by Molina Mercury, and it's a completely dead site. It's an X site. So th that's the um, Olympia cause. And also in anticipation of, uh, of uh, competition from Europe with a kind of merger of Greece with the uh, European Union. Yeah. Local industries were dying out. And, and this, is, this is the site seen from the top of Castella and Piraeus. And so <clears throat> his work started um, he, he, uh, a year before another design came up for this. And he asked us to make a team, and we had we actually traveled all over the world for him, looking for different, looking at different kinds of things, from things like City Walk in uh, Los Angeles. For you know, he wanted to us to consider these kind of um, themed shoppings, and um, and we act, and then we actually had to come up uh, come up with um, I think about ten different ideas, package ideas for the site. And, um, and these were completely different. Uh, I just complete this. He was interested in leisure, but he, since this was Piraeus, he also thought it could be a kind of marine thing, or it could be, because it was next to Olympia Coast, that it could become a big sports thing. And he was trying to get together a consortium of uh, investors. And um, <coughs> so uh, at the end, actually, I think I should just what, step forward. Yes, I sh this, this is. He made us do a kind of catalog of, um, of all these different types uh, that were there. And it was very curious because he wanted something that was completely representing the volumes because the people that he gave these things out to actually measured these volumes and they wanted to know how much they were getting. Um, uh, they, so he wanted something that was accurate for volumes and, um, but that, didn't, that looked like a building but wasn't actually a, a prescription of architecture. It wasn't architecture. He, he didn't want to be held to anything like that. And so we had to work out with him, develop with him a whole series of sort of strange building looking nothings. Um, okay, so I go back which actually. Which, which we, of course represented uh, different interests. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm going back and back. Okay. So for example, this is, this is a scheme that shows shipping offices with a marine museum. Um, forward. Uh, this is uh, a city walk mall and I think something to do with sports, I can't remember. Um, this was my favorite, that's the Oceanopolis. Um, and then we also had to illustrate this building uh, without, uh, so without, for, knowing what it without knowing anything and he just wanted sort of stupid, slightly glitzy, you know. So anyway, this is one of them on the right and of course the, the um, the, that plane never came anywhere near Athens. Um, and this is some other stupid thing, you know, to show sort of up and down pathways, blah, blah, blah. And actually, um, yes, so now we're coming to this mysterious thing that you see. So in the midst of all this, when, uh, when something was coming together, um, suddenly uh, the pop and the, what happened was that Mimi's friends had uh, met defeat on the other side of Falero Bay because um, they had made some kind of quite horrible um, Parthenon with golden horses on top for their casino, and the people didn't like that. <coughs> no, but it was also a kind of scandal of corruption that was exposed at the same time. 
Uh, you dream, Elia. No, it was. Um, no, there was a big citizen thing against this horrible, ugly, blah, blah, blah. So we were quite vindicated, but we didn't end up with a job. And um, so they decided to cancel the, the Fallero site and to actually make this the site. And, um, and so all of a sudden, that there was uh, one month for this one, but two weeks of it was, was putting the consortium together. It turned out to be Disney and um, Hilton and so on. So, yes, I agree. <laughs> so very, very quickly, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> Uh, here it is. Um, they, 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 the consortium, they, as I said, there were 64,000 square meters of building opportunity on the site. And the casino, again, was 25,000 with its little hotel, it's another seven. And so they got in continent supermarkets of France, which was another 25,000. And, um, and then they got together uh, also, so here is the casino, the black box. Here is the supermarket beneath the ground. And up here is, is actually the leisure center. It's uh, it, it, um, Cineplex and sports and blah, blah, blah. I can't remember now. It's too. OK, so, so how did this building come about? Um, it came about partly because uh, normally in America, when you're building one of these things, you can just plonk a shed on the site. But <clears throat> the Greek urban planning standards, believe it or not, <laughs> most people sort of don't know they exist, but anyway, there is something that when you're building on such a large plot of land, you actually have to have a meeting place for people to have political demonstrations and so on and so forth. So there has to be a lot of open ground on the building. And for us to get the 25,000 square meters, that would be one floor of this building, one sandwich, which meant that we actually had to have the ground partly open and the building on stilts for the political meetings, the markets, and everything else. So this, this is just the enclosed part of the ground floor. And um, I'm not going to go into this at any depth, but this, is the, the whole, this was a huge building that just depended on escalators. An escalator yeah. direct to the leisure on top, an escalator into the belly of the casino, and one to the supermarket. Yes, yeah, I mean, speak. As, as, was, as was evident from the diagram and from the brief and, and, and the restrictions of the site, I mean, as Eleni described, it had to be a pancake. It filled, it filled the floor. It was clear from the diagram that there w w one had to kind of search hard to find what could constitute architectural features. So it was very clear that uh, the, 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 the diagonals that were going up or down, whether they were going to be ramps, escalators, or whatever, were going to be instrumental as architectural features. And the other thing was the fact that being such a deep building and requiring daylight to penetrate in the middle of it, the, the, the voids that were to be created uh, and which would also kind of regroup the program uh, according to their light source were also going to be, to be the only other architectural features that, that were possible, that were available for this otherwise completely complete site coverage. Um, also, again, um, this was one of those buildings that you would see the roof, and we're not Actually, we show you this building, but we're not very happy with it. It's, it was something that had to be done very quickly, and it's a sketch of an idea. If it ever had gone ahead, he would have had the corner, and everything could have changed. But well, the other um, thing that was holding it up was that he was trying to buy this site, and uh, the owners were not selling. So he was always hoping that. So the whole thing, the whole design was being kept in abeyance, and, and, uh, oh. and kind of being Is that one, this one? As incomplete yeah. until, until that other corner side of the event. So um, anyway, so here was here's the leisure on top in the hotel and but basically why we put oh, it back. Sorry. Put it back. Uh, basically on the the, 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 the you, you missed the middle floor and right? the back is the white ones. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, you the ground floor was was basically uh, shopping uh, food hall market the, the usual kind of more uh, stuff, you know. Uh, but it was to be enriched by kind of these, by, by these light openings, one of which was also proposed to be an aquarium, which we hoped the client uh, would not reject, and he didn't. He liked it very much. He liked the idea. He was one of, he was an ideal person to work for. 
And then uh, the casino was going to be, so there were kind of bands of, of six meter height with, uh, with the mezzanines within, within each of those. The casino occupied uh, the uh, first and second floor levels. The supermarket occupied the, the semi-basement and basement, or six meters down into the earth. And, and, uh, and then the top floor was the cineplex, uh, of which the hotel occupied two levels. It was uh, Hilton's were going to put a small hotel there, which uh, they wanted to be either looking out towards the football stadium or to have a kind of a, 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 an internal courtyard created in which uh, a garden could be made. And that is what the two levels of the Hilton uh, Hotel created within the top six meter high sandwich. OK, well, the end of that, that particular story was, um, well, the project was delivered in two weeks. And um, actually, again, they had probably won. Um, but then Papandreou died, and um, and uh, the the new party just cancelled casinos in Greece. And Which uh, was, in a way, it was reasonable. But uh, by that time, the client got so disillusioned that he decided to close down this, that particular branch of his uh, enterprise. And of course, for us, that was uh, a major blow. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay, I, I can continue. Uh, this was uh, in, um, in, in 1990, you know it better, 1991, two. Two, um, uh, we, uh, the, the entry of uh, Greece for the Venice Biennale, it was three, 1993, <coughs> was uh, uh, to, uh, to ask uh, a number of uh, local <coughs> Greek officers to produce a design for uh, what would we, what would the Greek pavilion be in the Giardini in Venice if uh, one assumed that the existing one was to be demolished. Now the existing, I don't know uh, if you know the, 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 the structure of the Biennale, and we apologize to know we don't have a plan here today and a view it, but basically the Giardini is the only garden that Venice itself possesses. Uh, it is used for the Biennale, and, it, and every country has built a pavilion within it. All these pavilions are little monuments, sometimes not so little. And they kind of fill the garden uh, uh, with their kind of uh, presence. Uh, the Greek pavilion uh, was designed by one of uh, Greece's most uh, uh, famous uh, archipe you know, architects from the uh, all the generations, a few, a few generations back, uh, Picionis, who is kind of, I feel like, the father, is seen in Greece as the father of, uh, of, um, of modern Greek architecture. It's, uh, it's a very beautiful building in its own way, but it's extremely monumental. So the, the assumption was that the building was to be demolished, uh, and, uh, and what would we do instead? And, uh, and then I think you should speak about, what, about the idea. The idea being that uh, uh, we felt uh, th that uh, the, 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 the exhibition, exhibitions, summer exhibitions, exhibitions of art, uh, are, are tedious affairs in which people uh, kind of uh, uh, go queuing from monument to monument, sweating and uh, kind of uh, developing cellulite. Uh, try, can you, trying to kind of stand in front of, of pictures uh, uh, kind of uh, hanging on a wall. Uh, and um, Eleni had always this kind of uh, vision that, you know, the art is a kind of a, is an aristocratic um, uh, privilege that uh, it should be made available to the public, the public should feel that they own it, that they don't go, that they don't go uh, standing, uh, queuing in it, but uh, but in fact, they can, in leisure and comfort, uh, and a kind of a sense of sensuality, li while lying down and perhaps even bathing, they can, uh, or perhaps even eating and drinking, they, make, they become aware that they are surrounded by art, and they are also in a kind of magic garden. So the idea was to th that, uh, that the garden itself should be the place in which uh, the art should be exhibited, and the pavilion should become a mixture of landscape, 
uh, elements and uh, and uh, and uh, elements of art, or kind of, if you like, artificial uh, landscape elements. So, uh, in in, uh, in uh, our, uh, we also decided that that our project would be a kind of composition in which we would kind of quote uh, precedents. Um, by quoting various other uh, architects from the past, uh, or present, in fact, you know. But so uh, all the various parts become uh, showcases for exhibiting uh, various art pieces uh, out in the open. There is also an internal, uh, an internal hall, um, and uh, and and they are at the same time monuments to various architects. Okay. Well, yes. Um, uh, actually, the, the center of the scheme was raised water, a raised platform of water, uh, which of course you can see. And, um, and I did want to actually empty all the art out into the landscape as much as possible, but there is a small back building. Um, okay, and let's see. And things just grew naturally because uh, if you remember 1992 was somehow very important year for Europe, and I thought that uh, the Greek pavilion, it could too easily become some chauvinistic exercise. So um, since I wanted the, uh, the end result of this design to be something that was open all year round to the people of Venice, something they could use, um, uh, oh god, I got distracted, <laughs> was that my phone? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Yes, uh, oh, no, I'm, I got distracted. Well, anyway, the, the water became the centerpiece, and, um, and, and around it, oh yes, and I wanted to make a homage to Italy. So this is, this is here a reference to Superstudio, the continuous monument. Um, where is that thing? Just press it. Um, this, I don't know. Which goes, which goes horizontally and then vertically. And then and vertically. Then and because when it rises up, it becomes a, 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 monu a, a, a homage to Minoru Yamasaki, uh, together with the various other vertical showcases. There's a part of a roof that is taken from uh, one of our early buildings uh, with Eleni together in Greece. Um, Wait, and, and, and for those who don't know Minoru Yamasaki, he was the, the World Trade Center in New York which broke the scale of New York. So we this was breaking the scale of the gardens. And, um, and the front um, courtyard, kind of uh, this uh, uh, architectural shrapnel, uh, kind of which are showcases for the exhibit of art, were kind of inspired by Zaha's Tic Tics, which uh, uh, was uh, her invention of, of distributing uh, a, a kind of uh, art basically architectural shrapnel. Uh, and when she was asked uh, what are they, she said they are tic tics. So they 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 they, they, were, they were kind of a homage to Zaha. Yes, and um, and and uh, this this was this is really for older people, but this was a sort of little kick at um, all the anti-modern historicists at the time, because that's some trees that were left there as a memory of a nature reserve. And then where a tree actually had cut, had to come out, I put a ghost tree, like Ghostbusters. So yeah, there anyway. Was a, there, there was an artificial mountain, I mean, which- uh, A floral we, mountain. A floral mountain, which, you could, which was five meters high. You could go to the top and, and look down and enjoy uh, the whole garden as, as if it was a kind of uh, architectural uh, and, and these are painting. Yeah, and these are motorized water lilies that I saw in Osaka that become fountains. They dance in circles and have music and... They are water lilies that are kind of activated by music and they start dancing a ballet on the water. And, and on the right are the art lovers enjoying the... Anyway, we show you this old project. Um. <laughs> and uh, uh, in the 19... Oh, this was the only chauvinist piece here. That's the map of Greece, and that's where the water supposedly comes from. In the so uh, Fuchs has uh, decided to invite us to, to, um, to exhibit uh, our work uh, out in the Giardini uh, last year for the, for the Biennale in, uh, of 
2000, and uh, so we, we, we couldn't, of course, build the whole of this. But uh, we decided to, uh, because I had been appointed also commissioner for the Greek pavilion, we approached the Greek government and asked them if they would uh, sponsor the, an extension of the uh, Greek pavilion on the offer of uh, Fuxas to build a kind of a pavilion of our work in the gardens to sponsor a miniature version of that older design, which of course had to be adapted in a much more modest uh, form. Uh, fashion, but to represent some of the elements uh, that uh, the polemic of the earlier project uh, was kind of preaching. And there was a ghost tree, but it got used further down the canal, so, um, <coughs> oh well. <laughs> and, and there's asymptote in the background, the red. Uh, they the kind of Hani Rashid and came and uh, planted a spying installation there, to, uh, that was kind of stealing uh, all, uh, uh, all, all the, our secrets and transmitting them internationally, so kind of a global network, and that was his kind of installation, the red pit there. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, this is supposed to be going forward. Okay, mm -hmm. another lady. Okay, so this is the last project. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is in um, southern Japan, in the island of Kyushu. And um, it's very close to Minimata, where the um, mercury poisoning happened in the 70s, if you know that. And um, uh, this, the commission was for a house of youth. And, um, and they're normally, these are places that are built by the prefecture governments. And they're always cited in places of uh, natural beauty. And, um, and it's a kind of it's something like a summer camp, a Western summer camp, except that it operates all year round, and um, and it has more. Uh, it has also this. It has the sports, but also a bit more didactic program. And it can be, and you can actually. It's also for old people. It's basically a kind of uh, place for the province. So th this was our site. Our site was Ashikita, and it was a. Uh, here, I'll move on. Well, the site, kind of, uh, the, 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 the Japanese, uh, or in fact, uh, um, Isozaki, uh, decided that this site, uh, because part of the, of the uh, Kumamoto art polish for which Isozaki was, uh, kind of, uh, what he was called, a pro producer. Uh, and um, uh, he decided that uh, the site is very Mediterranean, and therefore he had to get Mediterranean architects to, to design, so that's how we got involved in that. Um, so the site is a, is a peninsula um, that rises quite high and, um, and it's built on volcanic rock that's <coughs> extremely unstable. And, um, and it's also, but, but this peninsula faces west into the sea and faces the Amaksa Islands, um, which are extremely beautiful. I mean, throughout Japan they're known as great beauty spots. And, um, and this, this peninsula had nothing on it, um, except that it had a uh, it has an extremely uh, tropical, uh, fast-growing tropical vegetation, which goes to about three or four meters in height, and um, <coughs> and it just and it, it's it's the vegetation that contains this uh, this friable uh, earth, this bad earth. So actually, um, we started off knowing that we would have to build structures on a slope, a steep slope, and that um, we would have to be dealing with um, uh, this. Uh, well, earthquake c construction, of course, um, and this problem of the earth, and uh, and also the fact of typhoons, because this peninsula was receiving the typhoons full in the face. Um, and this House of Youth project was split between us and Ryoshi Suzuki. We did it together from Tokyo. There's another architectural firm in Japan. So, um, just to qu I'll just quickly show you, th this is the sea around the site. I'm afraid this is the only site plan that has ever been made. This is the coming in from the coast road, a huge parking, a big baseball diamond. And then um, Ryoji's uh, tribute to Libera, really, um, a, a very big administration building, and then a dining hall on a lower level, and our buildings, the uh, Japanese tatami style dormitory well we took our brief uh, we took the expectations of the client very seriously 
they said they wanted the Mediterranean architect and that they w that we tried to, to start it to, to think of uh, trying to do a Mediterranean type of or architecture that hugs and follows the contours of the hills and kind of then cascades down in a kind of some kind of Mediterranean fashion or to town down the hill. Uh, and um, we already started very conscientiously kind of responding to the planned wishes. And what is interesting is that uh, somehow at some level all the projects that we've been doing uh, at some point kind of get a kind of a big blow and become adventures in which their seriousness is kind of ridiculed at some point. Uh, uh, we, uh, they become kind of uh, heart aching blows for us. But uh, kind of the, uh, an adventure that at the same time has become incredibly enjoyable. So uh, this was a ja I just You'll see. okay. Um, this was a Japanese dormitory. That was a Western style dormitory, and uh, and this was this was a very uh, primitive first sketch because we knew that we would be dealing with this kind of you know steep cuttings in the hill. Uh, we knew that there there was not much depth to do a building in, and um, and what was most and, and then every building had to be oriented toward this view, this western view, even though that also meant being oriented into the worst sun. Um, but I mean, this thing on the right came only after. Do you want to tell this one? But I mean, that came only after the blow. No, it didn't. That was before the blow. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, so this was the first sketch, and so we d we were doing the, uh, the the rooms were here, up and up and down. The sketch is bad because this is all supposed to be one uh, one shared space in the back, a double height space, and we knew that we would have to have a very sort of dense garden behind and the view in front, and um, we were trying to actually use this green plant in a very positive way, um, this kind of relative of, of mangrove um, plant. Um, to, to encourage it on the site and not to take it away because actually the, um, the government engineers just wanted to take it away. And so we would use that as a kind of stabilization of the site. And um, oh, so the first blow, yes? Yeah, I mean suddenly as we were doing, I mean, I, I really you have, you don't remember, but these things, <laughs> we, uh, we were not dreaming any of the, the, this kind of n network kind of, of uh, three-dimensional healing hilly uh, forms until later. It was the Okay, well anyway, you want to tell about it. Suddenly one day, we, as we were doing this kind of uh, village-like hugging stuff that was cascading down the form, we got a letter from, uh, from the municipality, the, from the, from the uh, uh, telling us that the engineers had been on site and, uh, and that the hill had been removed. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Because they had needed to make a room for a big uh, football uh, football uh, field and uh, a lot of parking, and so we thought. Well, we said we thought you wanted us to work on the hill to kind of be sensitive to the hills, as uh, as uh, being uh, being um, ourselves uh, Mediterranean, uh, and uh, they didn't know. Uh, what we were talking about, but in fact it was, so we became desperate at that point. <laughs> and from that point onwards, uh, the, we, we, kind of, the, we, we, we kind of became obsessed with uh, trying to replace the missing hills, you know, with, with the big <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we started with, as you can see, a three-dimensional um, three design, which actually would have been fairly easy to use, except the person who was running our job had um, suddenly developed um, a hatred for Ovi Arab, and um, and was insisting that it was impossible to use this. You know, this this is a um, the famous uh, German Otto Fry Fry Otto, fr uh, this kind of Fry Otto design, which is would have been very cheap. It would have met all their needs. Blah blah blah. But no, we couldn't do that. But anyway. So uh, and this and this this actually was our first. Uh, elevation in which we were using these replacement hills or clouds and then in front where they they would come quite far down over the building because this is the first floor line there's only two floors Eleni, um, Eleni had a kind of early concept we don't have a sketch of it a slide of it 
in which the, the, the building kind of hovered like a cloud. But the cloud later became a hill. And, um, and, and this was, these are broken into louvers, you know, sun blinds that could adjust and, and, uh, and cut the sun. So that was our starting but point. But of course, the, 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 the three-dimensional uh, geometry involving those was rejected on the grounds of economy. So we were, we were given a kind of uh, a strict rejection of that roof unless we could find a way of doing it in a two-dimensional with a two-dimensional geometry. So our effort became one to replace it with a two-dimensional. Uh, and, and, okay. and there's also a little subtext. Because actually, up to that point, we were very happily using our computers and everything was going brilliantly. And then all of a sudden, we became very determined on using uh, this, uh, of course, mountain cloud roof. Um, and, uh, but all of a sudden, uh, putting it into two dimensions, our computers could not actually handle it. And we had to go back and start working out all the um, geometric diagrams by hand. Um, but there was also another thing that we were told that uh, wait, our, Ilya. our builder could not, could not come Ilya, because we had please, a, very, wait. a very primitive builder. So. Okay, so I don't know, maybe you should no, just tell on, this story. Okay. Oh, okay. I interrupted you. All right, so, um, <laughs> so this became our next roof. Um, uh, what we, 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 div we went from um, the uh, working out the uh, geometric circles that I just showed you in that, that drawing to this. These are still being drawn by hand, strangely. Here is computer again. And here is a roof plan in which these are rafters, traditional rafters like in east and west, wooden rafters, um, with a cut in the middle. And, um, and, and this, and, and we were making one part go up and one part go down. I'm just showing you this quickly because, oh, did I? Well, no, they don't, but no. anyway. <laughs> okay, this just shows you the basic building, you know, but the, the main thing about this building is the roof because, in fact, with these narrow, steep um, hillsides and the trees growing up in front, you will never see this building except by the roof, from below or from above. Okay. No? Okay. I'm sorry. Ilya has become incredibly enthusiastic. He told me, you know, you're going to have to give this lecture because really I have a headache. <laughs> but, um, okay. It's passing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this, you can see here how these actually worked. And uh, no, I wanted this, yeah. And here you can see this is just one section of the kind of splitting. So that something that would be high in front 40 meters down the building would then go low and something else would go high and you could get these different um, uh, different uh, rhythms. Actually, these two undulating <laughs> wait, wait, <laughs> no, but what happened to the slide? I've lost an important slide to explain this thing. No. Okay, uh, well I guess I did lose it altogether. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's awful. Um, okay, so, uh, there, anyway, so what happened was that actually we, we worked the whole thing out. No, no, it's okay, Ilya. No, but there's a, there, it's this, it's this, yeah, okay. So this goes back. Right. Yeah, that goes back. So, Anyway, all of this was from a distance, and I'm actually missing a, a slide which is probably going to come up in a minute, so I have to explain that to you. That actually what happened was that we really couldn't do these, these roof drawings. We could do everything else in computer, but we couldn't do these roof drawings. And especially for our contractors here. Um, uh, the setting out drawings, you know, which means like how you place a building in the ground and how you start and, and so on. They actually decided that all the setting out had to be what height the roof was from the ground at different points. And so, um, so actually this is something that even your computer can't tell every you. Meter. Along every rafter, every meter. And so we sat in the office, I think for one week, calculating this thing, the wooden rafters of this building, and with a little calculator, you know, for each rafter for two buildings that are each 110 meters long. 
so, and that's how they set out the thing. So this is going forward. There it is, that's the drawing. And, and so these, these numbers here are telling these builders, you know, how high everything has to be. And that formed their wall which received the roof. Okay, so you saw the builders and in fact you saw probably a bit of that roof being built. And actually they had always said to us, what's happening with these slides? I'm not touching them. Can I go back? back? Um, yeah, uh, actually, well, anyway, um, they, they, uh, they had told us this is a very cheap building because this wonderful art policy prog program had collapsed just as we received our commission. And there was a new government governor who got in by campaigning on how much he hated waste and architecture and building and all this. But because this was a sort of important prefecture project, it had to go ahead. And, and then we here you can see how the building kind of acts as a kind of <laughs> barrier between the flatness of the parking, which is in front of us in that picture, and the slope of the hill, which begins from the roofs going down. That. Well, basically, they, when we started, they also told us this has to be super cheap because the public's going to complain. And so actually, we had designed this building, this roof, as uh, uh, wood and asphalt. And, um, and then uh, with all sorts of other features for people to enjoy like tea stations and stuff in their double height corridor. And suddenly it came back, no, no, you can't have asphalt, we have to have stainless steel. Um, and, and because well, of that, all the building the budget is cut. Cheaper. Yeah, stronger. But actually yeah. they had the point that in, the, in that climate, asphalt was not practical. So, but, so actually what this is, which is absolutely amazing, it's a concrete building with wooden rafters and, and stainless steel that is as thin as tissue paper just laid over these, these rafters. Um, okay, and here is a site you never see because this is from a helicopter and it allows you to look into this incredibly tight congestion of buildings. Um, the foreground are the buildings of, uh, of uh, Ryoji, yes. Suzuki. It's a telephoto. Okay, and this is basically uh, the somehow a, a very flattened relation. This is on the upper level, the Japanese, and this is all on the lower level. And it, it's almost, uh, uh, it's absurd anyway, because you'll see actually how tight everything became. And so um, this is the back of the Japanese one on the right. We talked them into making two hills to protect it from the, f the uh, parking. Um, and, and here is from, this is a view, you know, you see, you're seeing the lower one from the upper terrace. And here we are in the upper terrace looking at a lower one. So the idea being, I mean, this is a football pitch. And as you can see that the, the whole of the bay there is peppered with kind of little rounded islands. So that was the, the idea was that the roof at least would begin to kind of engage in the kind of existing topographic elements and just uh, uh, become part of a, uh, if you like, a uh, choreography between existing elements and, and this new element that try to mediate between the parking, the football, and, uh, and the missing hill. And, and this lawn here is being kept as a lawn at great expense. But what you see here is no longer lawn. The, oh, this is our false hill. This is the parking. This is a lower building. Um, it's no longer lawn. It's all this this kind of mangrove tree, and this, which is a you know um, a concrete berm but with holes, is also covered now in three meter bushes. So this was around the time of the opening of the building, and all this back here is covered in bushes. So in fact, now if we went back, we would just be seeing green and a roof. No, I didn't touch it. But it went back. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it, it's very strange. Now we're seeing the building exposed in a way. Here, here you can see how tight and jammed everything is on this very, very narrow space. And now this is also grown up. They just put some sakura trees also. So this is the kind of corridor side. The windows uh, are, are uh, the, the bedrooms are looking over to the sea, and the corridor becomes kind of public spaces where it widens up, and at these points is where the second wave uh, provides a kind of uh, clear story light into the kind of the corridor public space. Well, that's it. So, thank you. 
So that's uh, the project uh, uh, that we selected for this evening. Thank you very much. through the work is um, a kind of combination of different programs or activities, particularly in the earlier projects that you were showing. I wonder if you might say something about that, whether it's a kind of circumstantial condition of the kind of projects that, that you had a chance to work on or are still working on, or if it's something you seem to try and introduce almost deliberately at times as a way of mixing up. Well, partly it was a program, but partly it's, a, it, it's an interest. Well, have I <laughs> gone off the uh, air? Partly it's also interest to interpret things that way. The other thing that stands out of the work as I'm looking at it is uh, almost the, the section becomes an engine driving the projects at times. The, the small sketch that's shown of, of the project near the stadium, for example, the kind of inclined services, is it a strategy that then gets linked to this kind of mixing of programs? The section. It, you know, the, the section becomes almost the kind of principal diagram driving the project. Yeah, but the strange, the strange, the, the strange thing is that uh, our obsession, especially Eleni's, but I mean, generally our obsession is with the plan. And, uh, and that, that is the, uh, perhaps it's not shown, but uh, that's the part which uh, we spend most time, sometimes too much time. But, uh, but actually, I don't think we've ever done a kind of, you know, typical wedding cake uh, section ever. So. That's, I mean, it's interesting to hear it from you, and other people have said that, too. But, uh, it, se it seems things like the ramping surfaces or the inclined plane that connect things through, it seems to be a way of deliberately mixing yeah. the kind of standard type of yes, layered that. programs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, have questions in the audience? Yeah, I think we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.